Welcome to Knock Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting to you live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with a new episode with Simcha Jakobovich from Canada. Simcha Jakobovich is a three-time Emmy-winning filmmaker, best-selling author, and adjunct professor at Huntington University in Canada. He is an investigative journalist who specializes in biblical archaeology. So without further ado, I'd like to present to you, and you've been waiting for, Simcha Jakobovic. How are you, sir? And thank you so much for coming on to Tanat Talk. It's such a pleasure having you here, sir. It's great to be on. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, you know what? Um, people have been asking me all the time about, well, what's this show going to be about? What's it going to, you know? And for me, I was fascinated because um, I had, when I saw you on Facebook, I was thinking, oh, I've seen this guy on TV somewhere. And I couldn't remember, but you never forget a handsome face. And so we looked at it. The naked archaeologist. The right? naked arch. That's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. And so, um, and then I found out I was talking about you to Rabbi Michael Skovac. He goes, "Yeah, some guy. He's this is a good friend of mine." <laughs> I was like, "Really? Maybe we should try to get him on to knock talk. That would be fantastic." So, very good. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be on. Very good. For all you viewers who had just tuned in, our the call in number is below uh, on the bottom of your screen, 855-95-BIBLE. If you call, I will take your call. Um, and But if we're in the middle of a conversation, I'm just going to let you hold there. So just be patient. Listen to us chit-chat. It may take a few minutes. Uh, but then we'll take your call. And then after you state your comment slash question, then we'll disconnect. And that way he can address your question. You can watch it live uh, from your living room or wherever you're at. And then that will also free up the phone lines, too. So we may or may not get any phone calls. A lot of people don't even know what to ask, uh, which was kind of my, my – I, I was just amazed that we were able to get a hold of you as busy as you've been lately. So. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I work out of Canada, I live in Israel, I commute, <laughs> it's a long distance, it's hard to pin myself down sometimes, but it's great that, you know, we're connecting, and I'm in Toronto now, so we're at least in the same time zone. That Yes, that's great. I'm used to having people who are like Rabbi Singer who's in Indonesia. Um, we've got some people like Ira Michelson and uh, Chaim Kaufman who will be on tomorrow, they're in Israel, and it's really hard matching up the times. Especially for me because I'm in construction and during the daytime is when I do my thing. And so when I do uh, a broadcast with someone who's in a different time zone, oftentimes I have to schedule it uh, during the day when I'm typically working outside. So um, so with all that said, um, uh, you know, my biggest, my first wonderful question I had was, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into this field? What, what, what pushed you this direction? And I'm sitting here looking at those really interesting pictures. I'm going to put you at full screen. Those really cool pictures uh, that's behind you. I'm sorry, not pictures, but the, the pieces of archaeology pieces that's there on the shelf. Is that those, are actually, those, those are awards. Oh, are they really? They're awards. We've got uh, a lot of awards uh, besides the three Emmys that you talked about. But yeah, no, we don't have any archaeology in this boardroom. Um, it, it just, it's just, uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker, and and uh, those are some of our awards. Well, that is quite amazing. Very good. So, so how did you uh, tell us a little bit, even just real quickly on one foot, just from a youth all the way up to what put you in this uh, field? How did you become enticed with this? Uh, who did you meet? Did, were there certain people in your life that kind of helped you get here? Uh, who kind of motivated you and helped you stay focused? Well, I, I'm born in Israel, and I grew up in Canada, and now I'm back in Israel with my family. And, um, um, I, you know, growing up, I really didn't, uh, I'm a child of Holocaust survivors. Um, I grew up secular. Um, my parents, I think, were, are very spiritual. My dad, a blessed memory, he, he is a very spiritual person, but... He had lost his parents when he was four, then he went through the Holocaust. There was no, he, he, he lost, um, religiously speaking, we, we didn't really participate in, in, an, in, in a synagogue in some kind of organized uh, religion, as they say. But I'm Jewish, and uh, we grew up with Jewish tradition, and I think a spiritual home, but a non-observant home. 
uh, I was interested in philosophy and religion and political science, and that's what I studied in um, political science and philosophy in undergraduate at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, I, I, um, in graduate school, I went to study international relations. Somewhere along the line, I was set for an academic career. Um, I was doing a PhD in international relations, and uh, somewhere along the line, I decided that um, it's a long story, but I decided to go into kind of more political journalism, and I started writing for various newspapers, especially in Canada. Although I published some articles in the New York Times, but I mostly in, in Canadian newspapers like the the Globe Mail, the Toronto Star, and, and Montreal Gazette, and others. And then um, I, I became more active uh, on campus at that time when, I, uh, let's say, Jewishly, uh, as a Zionist, uh, arguing Israel's case on campus, which unfortunately people, you know, at that time we kind of won the, we had the, the hearts and minds of the campuses, but uh, later I think, um, the, the, at this point, things are bad. I think the, the case has to be remade. And um, what happened was that I, I became very active also on behalf of the Ethiopian Jews. I was the um, head of the North American Jewish Students Network, which was the Union of Jewish Students in North America. And uh, we brought up various issues. We were active for Soviet Jewry to free the Jews of the Soviet Union. And uh, the issue came up, which was then a fringe issue of the Ethiopian Jews. At that time, they were called Falasha. And really, they were black among Jews and Jews among blacks. They fell between the chairs. African Jews, most people, their stereotypes of Jews is not as Africans. Um, most Jews don't think of, I think things have changed now, but in those days, to talk about an African Jew, to a North American Jew was like talking about, a, I don't know, a Jew from outer space. It was, it just, they, they, they didn't connect. And, and these people, these Ethiopian Jews, and there are today over 100,000 of them, 120,000 in Israel. But at that time, and I'm talking about, um, you know, in, in the, in the late 70s, the early 80s, uh, really the whole issue came to the front. But uh, in the late 70s, I was, when I was 78 to 80, I was chairman of the network. I was introduced to Baruch Tigeni of Blessed Memory, who was really a hero of the Jewish people and of the Ethiopian Jews. He passed away just a couple of years ago. He was a dear friend, we became friends, and he told me how his, his community of Jews were, were being killed and raped and disappearing after thousands of years in Ethiopia where they were, you know, had been true to Torah, true to Judaism, and they were paying a price. They were called falashas, exiles, outsiders. And nobody was helping them, you know, people who were interested in kind of helping, being active on black issues were not helping them because they saw them as Jews. And Jews saw them as Africans and, you know, they had other priorities. They weren't going to help these people. So I became very involved in that. I published three articles in the New York Times, and I felt, and along with me, the other activists who were, there was a handful of activists who made a very big difference. It shows you that you can make a difference from Texas to, to mm -hmm. New Orleans, for, for, to Chicago, wherever you are. And uh, those activists became, uh, we became uh, convinced that publicity was saving lives. Every time there was an article, uh, there was activity by the government of Israel to help them. When the publicity died down, so did the activism. Israel is um, democracy. You don't lobby, you don't get. Um, so that's when my kind of Jewish side and my journalistic side meshed for the first time to make a documentary film. Uh, I tried to interest documentary filmmakers because I, I, I wasn't one, but they didn't want to make the film this, because Africa was dangerous, especially Ethiopia. There was a military Marxist regime. Nobody wanted to do it. It's going to, it was going to be expensive and dangerous. Nobody wanted to do it. So as my father taught me, you know, step up. If nobody's going to do it, at least I would try. You know, if I failed, I failed. 
And uh, a very long story short, uh, that was my first film. I ended up kind of learning on the job, a baptism by fire, to use that expression. <laughs> and uh, I made a film called Falasha Exile of the Black Jews, which was a theatrical documentary. But to raise money for the film, because I didn't have any money, I was a graduate student, um, I made little pieces that were broadcast as... Uh, as news magazine pieces uh, on NBC, on CBC, on BBC, all over the world. And these magazine pieces and a half hour version of the film and the hour and a half version of the film, according to The Economist, uh, became one of the reasons, one of the reasons, not the reason, but one of the reasons that the Israeli government was um, prompted to stage a dramatic airlift to bring uh, during Operation Moses, uh, thousands of Ethiopian Jews from Ethiopia to Israel. Mm -hmm. So at the end of that experience, I felt, wow, this is a great life to be a documentary filmmaker. One is I learned on the job and I felt very comfortable. I'm a storyteller and I felt very comfortable telling that story, telling my story through film. I felt you, you go around the world, you, you, you do interesting things, and, and best of all, you can make a difference, you can help. If I played any role, and if the film, my film played any role in helping to save lives, to bring Ethiopian Jews to Israel, I thought, wow, you know, what could be better? And especially as a child of Holocaust survivors, if I played any role, instead of sitting silently while Jews died, if I played a role in actually making a difference, Wow, that's fantastic. And I never looked back since then, since the mid-80s. Uh, Falasha was released in 84. I've done nothing but make documentary films and write books and articles. Well, I'll tell you, there's uh, the ones that I, I've only seen bits and pieces of them, but they were just, you, you know, everybody tends to uh, get, you know, attacked from every angle. You know, you've got uh, you've got people try, like regularly debunk, trying to debunk Rabbi Singer and debunk Michael Skovak and all his and debunk the Bible, debunk this, debunk that. What would you say for someone who was trying to do the same thing on your end? What I've been noticing, Simcha, is most people that that are doing this, this taking this action, really aren't doing it from an educational standpoint, but more of um, I don't know, just a different approach, and it doesn't even seem. Uh, you know, plausible the way it's been the way it's been handled. But uh, you know, um, is there what would you say for something like that? Actually, you know what? If you want to hold on to that, let's go ahead and take this call because that was kind of my question. Let's see what let's see what the callers have to say. Welcome to Tanakh Talk. Who do we have on the phone? Hi, this is Patricia. Hi, Patricia. Could you do me a favor? Would you turn down your computer monitor? I can hear it in the background, and it will actually cause some feedback. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Does that help? I'm sure it will. If you turned it down, that's that. It's just fine. Uh, Patricia, where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Michigan. Michigan. Welcome to Texas and Canada. <laughs> <laughs> what is your question for our beloved Um. Well, first I wanted to tell him how much I appreciated his show, The Naked Archaeologist. Thank uh, you. I watched. I think I watched every episode of that show. Are you yeah, there are 65 now, episodes. By, by the way, if, some, if people want to connect with me or order episodes or whatever, I have a blog, and I'm, I've been asked by my assistant, Nicole, to remind people every once in a while. It's www.simkajtv.com, and you can sign up for my newsletter. It's free, and you get updates of what I'm doing, where I'm doing it. Sometimes I show up and I give talks in different places. Or on Facebook, which is w, a Facebook thing, www.facebook.com, TV. So you can connect with me. And, and you just reminded me because of Naked Archaeologist and uh, there's three seasons and people who haven't seen them. Sometimes we just put them on, on the blog uh, and, uh, and take it from there. That is perfect. That is perfect. So, do you have a question for Simica today? Yes, I do. 
I wanted to tell Tim how much I appreciated the Naked Archaeologist. I watched every <laughs> episode of it. I might have missed one or two, but I doubt it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and um, left over from those days, I have a question. Um, do you know of any mention of the exodus of the Jews in Egyptian history? Or is there any archaeological evidence for the exodus that you've discovered? Well, I'm... I made a film uh, that James Cameron, you know, the most famous filmmaker on the planet, he executive produced it. Um, he co-hosted it with me. It's available at um, our site. Also, the company is AssociatedProducers.com. It's called The Exodus Decoded. And one day I want to write a book about it as well. But in The Exodus Decoded, which is a two-hour special, I show, I think, the archaeological evidence for the biblical exodus from from the Egyptian point of view. I, we, we, we go and we show all the evidence. Now, people have been debating it, but really there's been no, I think people pretty much, the evidence is the evidence. You can't argue with the evidence. And the, the, the central idea that, that it started on, is people who say it didn't happen and there's no archaeological evidence for it are people who misdate the Exodus. You have a funny situation where uh, a lot of scholars, not all scholars, but a lot of scholars, date the Exodus to the period of Ramses II. Now that's, uh, let's say, 1300 years ago. But according to the Bible, the uh, if you go backwards 480 years as the Bible tells you to from the building of the first temple the temple of Solomon the exodus happened around 1500 BC so there's like a 200 year or 250 year difference between the biblical date and the scholarly date now, if you get the wrong date if you say the uh, I don't know World War if in the future historians or archaeologists will say World War II didn't happen and the reason it didn't happen is because they think that it happened in 1845, in, in 1840, instead of uh, 1940. Then if you look in 1840, you won't find any evidence for, for, uh, for World, World War II. But if you look at 1939 to 1945, you will. You, you gotta have the right date or you won't find any evidence. Now, Imagine 3,000 years from now, if they're off by 100 years, that's not so bad. But, but sometimes you have this kind of scholarly arrogance, which says we can't be wrong about our dates. Well, sorry, history and archaeology are not mathematics and physics. You can't, and even there, you can be wrong about your dates. And if there are alternative dates, check them out. Don't decide on the date and then say there's no evidence. Look at various dates that fit the biblical narrative and ask yourself, is there any evidence? If you go to around 1500 BC, not only is there evidence for the biblical exodus, there's a mountain of evidence. The Pharaoh is not Ramses II, as in Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments and the way it's been depicted in Hollywood movies and so on. It's not Ramses II. During Ramses II time, there was no exodus. He was powerful. There was no setback, there were no storms, there were no plagues. But if you look back in the period of the so-called Hyksos, H-Y-K-S-O-S, -S, you can Google it, you see that, you see, for example, it's not me that says the Hyksos period is the biblical exodus. Josephus, the most famous historian of ancient Jewish history from the first century, from 2,000 years ago, he says... When we're talking about the Hyksos, we're talking about and the, ex, the expulsion of the Hyksos from Egypt. The Semitic people that are pushed out of Egypt, according to the Egyptians, they were pushed out, they didn't go out. When we're talking about that, we're talking about the biblical exodus. This is Josephus, this is not Simha. So if you go with Josephus, you see that he was right. And he's quoting Manito, an even earlier Egyptian priest who is equating the biblical exodus with the Hicksaw period. Now you go to the Hicksaw period, you, you find it all. You find that there was, the Pharaoh's name was Achmose. Now, it's a play on words because Achmose in Egyptian, um, 
uh, you know, means uh, a son is born to uh, um, uh, to the, to the moon, I think. Uh, uh, but but uh, Moshe means a son is born Moshe Moses, and without mentioning any any God. So what you have uh, um, is that Achmose in Hebrew means the brother of Moses. So you have a Pharaoh whose Hebrew, whose name in Hebrew means the brother of Moses, and he has a brother called Kamose, which is like Moses. So, the, so what happened is that it's not the way we see in Spielberg's uh, film on the Exodus. Uh, or in the recent film on the Exodus, you don't have Ramses versus Moses. What you have is, because we're told by the Bible that Moses grew up in in the uh, in the Pharaoh's uh, temp, uh, castle and kind of the the official residence of the Pharaoh. You have three brothers: one called Moses, one called the brother of Moses, and one called like Moses. And you ask yourself, well, did anything unusual happen during the reign of Achmose? Well, yeah, we have in the Cairo Museum something called the Storm Stele. And what does the Storm Stele of Achmose say? It says there was darkness. That, that's there was there, there was darkness. Three days of darkness. It's, uh, there was a storm like the likes of which we never saw. And if you go during this period, let's say the Ipawar Papyrus, which is sitting in Leiden, University of Leiden in Holland. What does it talk about? It talks about darkness. It talks about a hailstorm. It talks about rivers turning to blood, the water turning to blood. So actually, and this is them, this is not the Bible, this is the Egyptian um, archaeology, Egyptian papyrus, Egyptian stele. That's what they say. Now, if you talk to scholars who don't believe in all this, they'll say, oh, this is a genre. It's a type of way of talking. Excuse me, who says water turns into blood as a type of way of talking? Where else do you see that? Are there many papyri that talks about water turning into blood in every dynasty of Egypt? No, there's only one papyri that talks about the papyrus that talks about this, specifically during the so-called Hicksaw period. So in this movie, The Exodus Decoded, we basically synchronize the biblical narrative and the archaeological evidence. Now, uh, a lot of this stuff um, you can understand. Like in Achmose, he sees it as a storm created by the God. He sees it as a natural phenomenon that somehow is being used by God to punish him. Well, that's exactly what the Bible says. Meaning, whether you regard this as God manipulating nature. Or a lot of people want to say, no, he suspended nature. These are these are miracles, and there should be no relationship to nature. Well, you know, uh, one of the plagues is a is a lice infant infestation. That happens. You know, I mean, you, you don't have to the miracle, as far as I'm concerned. You don't have to say everything on its surface is supernatural. So um, basically, we look at the science behind the plagues and it's all there in the movie um in the documentary film the exodus decoded wow okay well you know what um Simica, if you don't mind uh because you we're kind of there's, uh, there's a book that just came out by somebody that i met in in professor james Tabor's conference a wonderful woman she just came out i i, I read a, a, a bit of it and endorsed it and it's on amazon and it's called something Jehovah exists. Oh, she, yeah, yeah. She um, uh, she um, gives really. She's worked this like a thousand pages or something. It's a monumental work, and she goes through all the Egyptian evidence. It's mind boggling. Is it called it, the, the in the title? Did she uh, use uh, spell it like uh, uh, Y H W H like you you in the hay and Bob and hay? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's okay. Okay, I'm gonna put that reference up here. Yeah, actually, um, I've been in contact with her, and it's, I'm, I'm glad you told me that you know her. Just, yes, Jodell. Perfect. Yeah. It's an amazing. It's what I've seen of it, and I've endorsed it. It's so scholarly. It's so in depth. And she also times it. I think 1550 BCE. 
I said 1500 BC, we're within 50 years. It's during that period, and she really goes through all the sources. Very good. We're actually going to be having her on the broadcast soon. Yeah, uh, that's amazing. So, She's a very articulate, well, you know, woman that's done, you know, a decade of research. That's amazing. And how, how did y'all meet? Professor James Tabor from UNC Charlotte has an annual conference that's attended by a lot of Noahites, people who, uh, I guess, left Christianity and they're not, didn't convert yet to Judaism. They're 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 Gentile followers of uh, the God of Israel. Uh, they, you know, that's how they define themselves. And you have also Christians. There are different stages. You have Jews come there. It's a very interesting mix of people who are, I think, interested in the in in the truth of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And part of what they're searching for is the historical evidence, the archaeological. Um, uh, artifacts, and uh, I was invited there several times to speak. It, it's uh, it's in Charlotte, and I didn't go this year. I couldn't go, but I love going there, and I meet the most amazing people. I mean, I meet truth seekers. They're very mm -hmm. rare these days. Most people are looking to you know to change their sofa. I don't know to get a newer car, a better mm -hmm. a better sure. computer, and it's very rare to find people that are motivated by desire. To find out the truth, and and whether they're you know they agree or they don't all agree with each other, but at least what's motivating them is not ego. Right. All right. I couldn't be wrong. I'm a professor. I got a PhD. I've got to be right. It's what's true, mm -hmm. and and that's I always find kind of my 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 intellectual and spiritual uh, batteries recharge when I go to Professor James Tabor conference because I meet these people. People who are just will sit up all night discussing, you know, the Exodus and the evidence and the Bible. And it's really terrific. And uh, that's where I met this wonderful author, and, and she just came up with this book. Well, that's fantastic. Um, so how do you how do you deal with people? I'm, I know you probably have uh, seen them. I know when people kind of come uh, come to me and they try to talk to me about what I'm doing, and and I get a lot of flack on face on uh, YouTube a lot, and I typically just ignore most of them because uh, it seems like when they come at me, um, probably the same way they would they would come at you. It's it seems to be just with the wrong attitude, I think, uh, which really turns me off from wanting to spend time with it. Uh, but as I was mentioning earlier, you know, everybody's trying to debunk everybody these days, you know, and um, I came out of Christianity and uh, one of the things that uh, that used to get debunked in while I was a Christian was all the shows about biblical things and archaeology on the his History Channel and Discovery Channel. They would say, oh, you can't watch that stuff. You can't believe that stuff. And so it, and they would say they're just trying to disprove the Bible and all or, or disprove uh, you know, the, the Christian faith or whatever the case may be. And so for years, I stayed away from that altogether. And uh, but after I left the church altogether and left the entire New Testament teaching behind, um, I started going watching a few of these things. That's when I kind of stumbled on yours. And I, I ran into James Tabor uh, and some others. And so what is the uh, what would you say to someone who has really not yet explored uh, the archaeology from like from your perspective and from others who are in your field uh, that are establishing grounds for the existence of Tanakh and the truth behind it. Is there something you could, um, you know, kind of direct them in that way? Well, you know, I mean, I'm not a proselytizer. I don't argue theology with people. I'm, I'm, uh, I use the tools of investigative journalism in the field of uh, biblical archaeology mostly, but archaeology generally. And I believe that when I go out on an investigation, I'm driven by one thing, to report on the truth as I see it. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I'm infallible, but to report it as best I can. Not to say, oh, that guy's a liar because he doesn't say what I want. Oh, that guy doesn't believe him because he, uh, you know, he contradicts my theology. Oh, that guy is a fool because he doesn't have a PhD. That's not what drives me is the evidence. I, I want to tell a truthful story. So if that's what drives somebody, I think that they're on safe ground. I don't see, I, I'm, I'm a religious, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I wasn't uh, always 
I grew up secular, and in my own spiritual journey, I um, became observant as an Orthodox Jew of, of, the, of the Sabbath, of the truth of the commandments of the Torah. But I don't, at any point, you know, my rabbi, my religion doesn't ask me to choose between truth and faith. I, I, I don't I think that's a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. And if any religion or religious leader asks you to do that, that tells you something about that religious leader, because that means that he's, he or she is not comfortable with the truth. They're worried about it. If they say, don't watch that, don't watch this, I don't, you know, I, I watch everything, you know, mm -hmm. anything credible. And, and if it's not credible, I have the reason why it's not credible. It's not because it contradicts me. It's because the evidence is not there, the argument is not well made. And so on. So what I'm saying is, to me, it's very foreign to have a conflict between faith and truth. It doesn't exist for me. My religion does not ask of that of me. Nobody asks that of me. And so when when uh, you know when I find evidence um, for something, for example, in biblical exodus you see that there was a whole bunch of natural volcanic eruptions at the time and so on. That doesn't, I don't have a crisis of faith at that moment. I, I try to understand the biblical story in, in light of the archaeological and scientific evidence. And what I find is that my faith actually has gotten deeper because instead of it being in a vacuum, mm -hmm. it's grounded in, 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 in real history. So for those people that read, um, you know, the, the, the Bible is a mythology where they can't, you, know, you have secular people say, oh, this is a myth, I don't relate to it. And then you have religious people who say, oh, this is divine word, I'm, I'm not allowed to look at the actual you know, history or archaeology. I don't understand them, I don't try to argue with them. If you don't, if you're not interested in history and archaeology, Okay. Now, it, generally what I've found is that the, the, when we're dealing with the Torah, uh, people don't have a problem because uh, when you get into the Gospels, when you get into Christian theology, there is a, there's, there's a tension between what is being unearthed in Israel today and Christian theology. Now, we, we've got to deal with the fact. And the fact is that after 2,000 years, the Jewish people have returned to their ancient homeland. That's a fact, and some people have a lot of problem with that fact. There's now, you know, the population of Israel now is, is over 8 million, uh, 7 million Jews. I mean, there's more Jews living in Israel today than in the rest of the world. Um, this is the first time that that's happened in over 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's unbelievable. There's no precedent for it, right? The ancient Greeks haven't come, you know, the ancient Spartans haven't come back to Sparta. The, the ancient uh, Babylonians are not marching back to Iraq. So there's really no precedent for this. What's happening is by the Jew, Jewish people living and rebuilding their land, they are unearthing what normally would not be unearthed. Meaning, if I'm living in Jerusalem, and I want to build a basement so that I can have a playroom. By just being there, and by, by digging into the ground so that I can build my basement, put a ping pong table there, I may come across ancient artifacts, ancient tombs. And that's what's happening. There's been more than uh, 600 tombs, maybe as many as 800 tombs from Jesus' era, from the first century, unearthed since 1970, let's say. So for 2,000 years, these tombs have been in the ground. Odds were that nobody would ever find them. But because of the uh, return of the Jewish people to Israel and the birth of the modern state of Israel in 1948, you suddenly have archaeology of the first Second temple period of Jesus' era coming to light that really by all odds should not have. What's happening 
that archaeology sometimes does not match the Gospels. And that upsets people. It upsets people because don't tell me Jesus' tomb is in Tokyo. Jesus' tomb is in, in the, under the Church of the Holy Sepulchre because that's where Christian tradition says it was. So, you know, uh, the reaction, you know, Christians react different ways when confronted with archaeology that deals with the Gospels. They either say, wow, I didn't know that. This enhances my understanding of the Gospels. Uh, or they say, don't tell me anything that's not in the Gospels because I don't want to know, because if it's already in the Gospels, then I don't need to know. And if it's, con it's not in the Gospels, then I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people who react like that, they, they're either friendly uh, or they're, they get upset. They say, you know, what are you saying here? Uh, that the Gospels are not the way, you know, uh, they've been written. And, and other people, they look at that and they start a spiritual journey. I met people who, when they started looking into the Gospels from a historical point of view, what they did is they went on a spiritual journey that on the one hand, they feel got them further from the Gospels, but closer to God. Um, and I meet people in all, and you know, and people, Christians who stayed with their Christianity and Christians who modified their Christianity and Christians who left their Christianity. And I meet, I meet people all along the spectrum. And, um, you know, I, I as, again, I say, I'm not in the theology business. I don't argue with people's theology. I respect, I respect people's faith. And, but, where I connect with them, where I don't connect with people is when they're not interested in, in looking at the evidence. Right. Where I connect with people is where they're willing to discuss the evidence. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who um, has left Christianity uh, because of the reasoning that they understood how to process um, what can and can't be trusted based on Torah and based on Tanakh, so they leave that behind because they find out it's a violation of all these things. So now they're in the Noahide uh, gear category, and um, they're around other people who will tell them, you know, well, if you use the same logic, you know, the, even you know, the Old Testament can't be trusted either. Therefore, you know, the whole thing is a sham. And these people will fall prey victim to that. And so not to the ones who are trying to deceive people, but to the ones who are being deceived in that approach, is there something that you could tell them, just yeah, a few little jewels that would maybe help them gain better clarity on their misunderstanding of, uh, of the validity uh, using arche archaeological facts and things like that? All I can say is the more I have looked at the history and the archaeology of the Torah and the Tanakh, the, the Christians call that the Old Testament. I, I don't like the term because it's really, what does Old Testament mean? It means it's a New Testament. It means that that's, that, that covenant is it's a theological position. It means God had a contract with the Jewish people. That contract is no longer valid. It's old. It's being rewritten by, by uh, the New Testament, and that's the New Covenant, and the, the Christianity of the New Israel. I find those terms insulting as a Jew, because it says you, you're, you're passe, you're no longer viable. What you believe in is old, what we believe in is new. So, uh, but what Christians call the Old Testament is really what Jews call the Torah, the five books of Moses, and the Nach, which is prophets and, and you know all the other books of the um, of the Hebrew Bible um, Kings 1 Kings 2 we have a bunch of books that together form the Tanakh Torah and Nevi'im and uh, the more I look into the history and the archaeology of the Tanakh the more I find that not only do they match but they enrich each other by, by studying archaeology, I understand the Torah better. So, for example, I mean, there's a path. You know, Moses confronts a pharaoh. There were pharaohs. That's a historical fact. But it's a title. Pharaoh means the great house. If you study Egyptian, uh, in the Torah, it talks about Paro, or Pharaoh, and talks about Melech Mitzrayim, king of Egypt. So here's an example. 
today, English translation and, and in Hebrew, people think that these are synonyms for each other. It's exactly the same thing. But they're not. They're titles, and they're different titles. We don't think that the Queen of England and the Prime Minister of England are the mm -hmm. same people. Right. We know they're different people. Right, they have right. different titles. Now, King of Egypt and um, uh, Paro are different titles. We know these titles from Egyptian history. One is of Lower Egypt, which is the upper part of the map. One is the Upper Egypt, which is the lower part of the map. And even in movies, you see that they had two different crowns that fit into each other. Mm -hmm. Now, some pharaohs wore both crowns. Some pharaohs, uh, some uh, rulers only wore one. Now, in the, when we read the Torah, it seems like there's Moses is confronting one guy. But actually, once you know that these are two different titles, you realize that there's two different people, king of Egypt and pharaoh. In the Hyksos period, there were two different people, a king of Egypt and a pharaoh, and they were different. That suddenly takes the whole biblical exodus and puts it in the context of an Egyptian civil war. Mm -hmm. It changes things. So what I'm saying is that once you know the history, it doesn't, it, it doesn't sh it, my faith, which is my faith, and people, it, you know, it's all myth, that they just don't know their history. They have a secular faith that is as, that is dri driven almost by <coughs> a religious zealotry, that they, it's not true, it didn't happen. Why? Because it's important for them to say that it didn't happen. Maybe it shakes up their secular faith. <clears throat> so all I'm saying is that I don't know what to say to people who are not engaged in truth-seeking. You know, a detective tries to find out who, who done it, who really done it. You don't want to bring into court somebody um, who's innocent. I'm sorry. Nicole, can you bring me a glass of water? <coughs> sorry. That's all um, right. So... Um, you know, by the way, today in the news, there's all over the, Israel, the Hebrew news, but also in the Times of Israel, there are linkages, if you put. Uh, uh, there was a, an individual in, in Jerusalem. There is an individual in Jerusalem who um, libeled me. Now, some of the people, the way they argue is instead of, instead of arguing about the evidence, they, 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 they libel the messenger. So the way that he wanted to win the argument, and he was egged on by a, a bunch of uh, people in the United States with theological access to grind, and they were kind of egging him on to, to libel me and, and uh, supporting him financially in this uh, court case that I could I sued him for libel. And the court, uh, this went on for four years, and today it's all over the Hebrew press. He was found guilty by the judge on 10 counts of libel, six of them premeditated with um, intention to cause harm. Now people ask me, why did you sue this guy? Why didn't you just ignore him? Which is you also asked me, why don't you just ignore some people? I ignored him for many years, but at certain points, we cannot let the bullies, the theological bullies get their way. We can't be intimidated into silence. I can't tell you how many professors I meet that say, I agree with you that there's archaeological evidence for the biblical exodus, but I'm afraid to talk about it because I won't get tenure. Mm. The, the, the bullying has got to stop. And what I did, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I'm, you know, I'm an adjunct professor at Huntington University, but that's not that's an extra thing that I'm very honored to do, but that's not my livelihood. That's not what I do professionally. So it's, it's tougher to bully me because, um, with, you know, people who are worried about feeding their children, uh, they're more susceptible or to having their careers destroyed. But what I wanted to do is draw a red line in the sand. And today, uh, the courts in Israel vindicated me, which wow. is we should be able to have a reasonable discussion between people of different the theologies, different beliefs, and look at the evidence for what it is and not bully each other. I don't want to be bullied and I don't want to bully anybody else. So an answer, the short answer to your question is 
seek the truth, ignore the bullies as much as you can, but, but if they're trying to uh, win an argument, or what's called an ad hominem argument, by insulting you, either walk away or, you know, confront them. Say, you know, I, I won't, you know, I mean, unfortunately for years, people try to enforce their beliefs through, through bullying. We see that today in, 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 in the Middle East with ISIS, killing people, hurting people, crucifying people, uh, uh, crucifying Christians. And we see that, uh, uh, we saw that in Christian Spain, you know, with the Inquisition. Um, we've got to say no to theological bullying, and we have to be for a free and democratic debate and let the theological pieces fall where they may. Well, I tell you what, you definitely uh, clarified um, something that's been bugging me and a lot of other people for a long time. And that's really good. And that's something I've been noticing too, is that um, most of the people that, that come to me, not, I mean, regarding uh, New Testament issues, is um, they'll, they'll try to, to stick with me just on my, maybe one topic until they find out that I know uh, enough about it to, to kind of basically to debunk their theory on it and then they immediately pretty much start turning into attack mode into like attacking the person character or something the best way they can and that's you there's really nothing you do about that is like you said just just walk away or or address it you know well so, i you know i address it you know i who have no arguments that's when they get personal mm -hmm. you know right very good very good Okay, Simka, you gotta you gotta give us your opinion on something that I'm sure everybody's got to be curious about. Where was the crossing of the Red Sea? Was it, uh, you know, to the right of the Sinai point? Or was it to the left? Was it up high, closer to the Baal Zephon? What What do you think? What's what it was? What's all that about? Give some clarity. Well, again, by the way, I'm going to refer people again to my website, which is www.simchajtv. It's like my name, Simcha, or Simcha, pronounced, but uh, and my last name is Yakubovich or Jakubovich. So Simcha, S-I-M-C-H-A-J-T-V.com. I discuss a lot of these things on, um, and you can even look at past blogs, and you'll see there it says Biblical Archaeology. Or on Facebook, which is Facebook, www.facebook.com, SimchaJTV. And uh, I discuss the, the, the evidence for the biblical evidence, uh, 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 biblical Exodus, and so on. In the movie Exodus Decoded, which you can purchase or you can see it, um, get it from associated producers, uh, it aired on the Discovery Channel. It's co hosted with James Cameron. We actually, I think, pinpoint the exact location of the crossing. Now, uh, when I say that, people say, oh, that sounds crazy, you know, you know exactly. I don't know exactly. I just, I just take seriously the words of the Torah. If it gives you exact coordinates, before I reject anything, I actually try to go to see where is this place. Like, for example, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, the Torah doesn't say, the, the books of Moses don't say, oh, it, it was there out there somewhere in the desert. It actually tells you, you know, it's two weeks walk from uh, this spot and uh, one week from mm. here. It, it tells you the exact coordinates and when you actually triangulate them, which I did, and you go over that area, you find a mountain that fits the biblical description to a T. It's right next to the road. I mean, these people, Moses at 80 years old was not a mountain climber. He didn't have you know, gear and go out there, you know, snappling. I mean, so it fits exactly. The Jewish tradition says it's flat, it's not conical. It's a flat mountain exactly where you, uh, you would expect it. If it says two weeks walk from a place called Kadesh Barnea, archaeologists have identified Kadesh Barnea. There's no dispute about it in archaeological terms. So go over there, ask a Bedouin, how, you know, how, how much, what do you cover in one day? What do you cover in two weeks? And he'll tell you. They've been living there for thousands and thousands of years. He can tell you what a two-week walk is from Kadesh Barnea. So um, where uh, the crossing happened, you know, there actually isn't a lot of 
options because people usually get the, the Jewish people crossing the Red Sea sometimes into Saudi Arabia. Well, I, you know, I wish that were true because that would mean all the ancient Jews were, each and every one of them, Olympic athletes. They could run in record time because the, the Bible says how long it took them to get there, to get to the place of the cross. They just left Egypt. They just went out and the Pharaoh changed his mind and he, he, he chased after them. So if they can cross the entire Sinai Peninsula, old people, children, and, you know, in a matter of days, I mean, all of them, you know, would, would be like uh, Usain Bolt, Jamaica, the world champion and runner. They'd make him look slow. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you can't mythologize this. you got to ask, well, how far can, can you know, the Bible says it's 600,000 men of fighting age. That means you're dealing with about 2 million people. If you're dealing with 2 million people, they can't get very far in a couple of days. You've got to look. And, and it says that, it doesn't say Red Sea, in the Hebrew original, a lot is lost in translation, it says Yam Suf. Mm -hmm. Suf means read. Again, what I'm telling you, it's not my theory, so I think all scholars agree that it's the Reed Sea, not the Red Sea, it's the Reed Sea. Now, reeds grow in sweet water, not salt water. Mm -hmm. It can't be the Mediterranean, and it can't be the Red Sea. Reeds don't grow in sweet water. And, and salt water and sweet water. So you got to find a place that reeds can grow in. And and there is a, a a lake. And by the way, the word for lake, the Sea of Galilee, is is uh, is not called you know, um, can, you know the word for lake in Hebrew is this. It's Yam. It's the same as sea. So uh, you you've got to find a place close to. Uh, lower Egypt, where where uh, where the Lucas has happened, and it's got to have sweet water, or at least a mixture of sweet. You know, some of these lakes, you know, you have the Great Bitter Lakes chain, and that right at the top, you have a lake that's still on the map. You could still see it on maps, but it doesn't. Ever since they built the Aswan Dam, it's dried up, and it's called uh, Lake El Bala or Arabic pronunciation, El Balah. But in Hebrew, El Bala means where God swallowed up. And the Bala, Livloa, it's exactly the same word that the Torah uses when it talks about, uh, uh, you know, s swallowing up the Egyptian army and so on. So you have a lake called, this is the lake where God swallowed up. El is God. Now, you always start, when you study, say, rabbinic literature, the Talmud, they say, start with the pshah. Start with a simple explanation. Be like, ah, ah, ah. Before you dismiss, just start with the pshah. There's a lake that to this day is called God Swallowed. Does it fit what did it have reeds? Yes, it did. Does it, what was it called in the ancient days in Egypt? It was called patufi. This is not me. This is Professor Bitak from Vienna who's been digging in Egypt for years. Patufi is the same as Yam Suf. Tuf and, and, and um, the, the Egyptian and the Hebrew, uh, Suf and, and Tuf are the same. So you have a name that's in the G Egyptian annals and the Hebrew Bible, the same place. And it matches what you find on the ground. Now, the irony is that because of the Aswan Dam, it's dried up, which tells you what? That under certain geological conditions, it can dry up. Mm. You can walk on it. I walked on it. I walked on in the very place that the Bible says, the Torah says, that the Jews walked on dry land after the, the splitting of the sea. Now, that means that under certain geological, you know, if you have a, um, a tsunami, if you have an earthquake, if you have some kind of variation, it's quite flat of the land, you have entire areas that are that are become dry. So what I'm saying is this is not Hollywood special effect. This is actual geology. And uh, I believe that's exactly where, where it happened. Now, recently I've read that these all these lakes were connected to the the one sea area with with uh, with the with the waterway between Saudi Arabia and Egypt, 
and uh, they found a little bit down the way from um, uh, Yamsu, from Lake Elbala, uh, evidence of um, Hiksa armies and uh, Egyptian armies. Now, I haven't looked at that evidence, but it, it seems to be in the right place because it would have been dragged down. Uh, so there may very well be now archaeological evidence of this army that got overwhelmed by by this uh, by the splitting of the sea or the tsunami or whatever you want to call it. Hmm. What would be your favorite thing that you've been working on lately? Now, out of everything that you've done so far, what is probably the thing that brings you the most uh, the most uh, joy or nachas or however you say that? <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to express what little Hebrew I know. <laughs> yeah, here I, I wrote a book with my colleague and friend Barry Wilson, Professor Barry, Barry Wilson. He is a professor at York University. He's a world authority in um, early Christianity. He wrote a book uh, called How Jesus Became Christian. Um, and, uh, you know, he, we wrote together a book called The Lost Gospel. You can get it on Amazon, The Lost Gospel. Basically, we decoded a gospel that has been hiding in plain sight. It's sitting in the British uh, Library. It's written in ancient Syriac, which is a version of Aramaic, which is like Hebrew-like language. Uh, we had it translated by, by an expert in Syriac. Um, and uh, we offer the first time this translation of the, the earliest version of the story, which is written in Syriac. And uh, the book is our commentary on this gospel and an actual translation of uh, um, the gospel made by Professor Tony Burke. Uh, and uh, basically, you know, I worked on it six years with Barry, and it tells the history that I believe is the real history behind the crucifixion, the real history uh, behind the gospels. And uh, for me, this was you know, a, a, a great, a great endeavor, and we made also once one documentary. We'll be making more on the book that I was called Bride of God, and it aired on uh, the Science Channel in the United States and Vision in Canada, and it's coming up on Vision again in a few weeks. And uh, that that was the last thing that that I worked on. Also, um, my friend Dr. Arya Shimron, who's a geologist. Uh, who I respect so much. Uh, we became friends over his work. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a groupie. And uh, he uh, recently made headlines, Easter Sunday, page 10 of the New York Times, uh, about his finding. Uh, of, he did a, a four-year geochemical uh, study of the so-called James Ossuary. The, the artifact that says on it, the bone box or coffin of the brother of Jesus. And he linked it geochemically to the Talpio tomb, the Talpio suburb of Jerusalem, which I believe is Jesus, the Jesus family tomb. And uh, he, by, by, by placing the James ossuary in the context of the Jesus family tomb, statistically speaking, I think he's closed there's nothing to argue about now. There's no question that the Jesus family tomb is in Talpio, was in Talpio, the suburb of Jerusalem, and uh, that's where Jesus of Nazareth and his family were buried. That was the, probably the estate of Joseph of Arimathea, uh, which is a nearby tomb that probably belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. This tomb has been studied more than any other tomb on the planet and has more evidence than any other tomb on the planet. But because it's theologically problematic, and people can debate what it means, um, you know, nobody's talking about it. I mean, mm -hmm. to me, it's amazing. Jesus' tomb has been found, and nobody's talking about it. I think people are in theological or cultural shock. Now, how seriously so, so, do so we... So you ask me what gives me the most nuts, the most... It's these things together, because for me, I find it very, very satisfying to use the tools, my tools, my profession, investigative journalism, in the area of biblical archaeology and history. 
because I think people for the longest time haven't touched it. Jews didn't touch this area of the first temple, of second temple Judaism, late second temple Judaism, because they oh, that's Christian, we don't want to get involved. Christians haven't touched this area because they all have theology, we don't want to contradict it. So you have th this black hole in historical space. Hmm. For me, it's amazing to, to, to sail my little rocket ship into this black hole in historical space, to, to go into this vacuum and come out with evidence. And people say, well, why did it you find all this stuff and nobody else does? My answer, my answer is simple because nobody's looking. <laughs> I think that's the answer we've all been waiting for right there. Mr. Tabor looks, he finds. You yeah. know, Arya Shimron looks, he finds. If you look, you find. Mm -hmm. But because people say, oh, that's Christian, oh, that's history, oh, that's this, they don't look. And they get angry or upset or whatever when people do look. Right. So that to me, also as a Jew, uh, this is my history. You know, I, I was once on television in uh, Montreal, and we had a French interview, and this guy who's Catholic, he said, why are you messing with my religion? Because I, uh, I was reporting on the Talpio tomb. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, you know, he said, you're a Jew. Why are you messing with my religion? And I said, yeah, I'm a Jew. And as you know, Jews answer questions with questions. So I've got a question for you. Jesus never... According to Christian theology, Jesus never left Israel, the Holy Land. He lived in a country called Judea. Ancient Israel was called Judea during Jesus' time. People now call it Palestine because they've got a political agenda. But it was called Judea, right? Uh, he lived there his whole life. He was born there. He was crucified there. Uh, you know, he was buried there. Um, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, wherever he was, you know, this is where he lived. He didn't speak French or English. He spoke Hebrew. He probably spoke Aramaic and probably spoke Greek. He didn't speak French, English, or anything. He never left Israel. He was a Jew, right? He, 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 he you know, he ate kosher. He kept the Sabbath. If he arrived on the set of this uh, interview in Montreal and you asked him questions, Jesus and if the second coming were to happen, as Christians say, I'd have to translate for you because he didn't speak French. So here's a guy who lived in my capital, Jerusalem. I have a, he never came to Montreal, never came to Quebec. So I said, I have a question for you. Why are you messing with my history? And he said, okay, let's change subjects. And, 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 and that's very telling that, you know, I'm excited you know, as a Jew, to study Jewish history. And I'm amazed that Jews have uh, uh, shied away from studying their own history because maybe by doing so, it's going to con contradict or, or, you know, a Catholic tenet or an Anglican tenet or whatever. Uh, so for me, this has been gratifying, both professionally as a journalist and, and spiritually and Jewishly. Wow. I tell you what, it's just been—it's amazing to talk to you. Uh, you know, to, to, it's kind of—I get the same feeling with you as I did with Rabbi Toby Singer the first time. I was like, I was kind of in awe. I didn't know what to say, you know. So I'm just so grateful that you've had the time, or, or shall I say, you took the time out to to actually come on the broadcast and and answer these questions. And uh, you know, with uh, with the Shem's blessing, maybe we'll have another broadcast. Uh, in the next in a few months, if you've got time, I know you said you're traveling uh, back and forth from Israel now, and from Canada to Israel. Is that kind of your? Yeah, but I get to the United States every once in a while, and you know, the people sometimes invite me or a film festival or whatever. So I, 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 I get around. I'm gonna, um, you know, I go to, I have to go for work to New York to LA, and so I get around. But I'd love to be again on your. Uh, on your show, I enjoyed it. Uh, my company is Associated Producers, and we have a website you can get our films. Uh, my blog is simchajtv.com. I also blog on the Times of Israel online, uh, and my Facebook is uh, facebook.com simchajtv. Very good. So uh, I'm happy to connect with people. I don't. I can't always. I can't always answer. I guess I get a lot of comments, and sometimes again 
if you think I can answer all of them individually, but I get I love an opportunity like this where uh, you know if you send me this, I'll put it on I'll put some link to okay absolutely 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 and we've we've had the uh, the website posted up on the screen so everybody can see it uh, during the times that you've spoken about it as well and so uh, I, I think I actually may have one uh, have the book uh, you said it was called the Lost Gospel is that right? the Lost Gospel with Barry Wilson and uh, Run Don't Walk to Your Nearest Amazon uh, nice. but, uh, it's been um, this just came out a few months ago. It's been an Amazon history bestseller, and uh, it's uh, it, it lays out all the evidence for this uh, new gospel. That's fantastic, hey. Simca. You're the man. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, folks. Y'all go to his website, uh, Simca. JTV.org. You can find everything that is available through that site and follow him on Facebook. So until next time, shalom, shalom, everybody, and we will talk to you again soon. Thank you.